And I tell you what, you can be turning in your Bibles. Let me get my mind open first. Thank you, Jesus. Turn in your Bibles to Proverbs 29. We're taking up the offering. We speak this offering blessed. One hundredfold return for every seed sown. And as tithers, we speak the windows of heaven over our lives and over this church. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Barry. Hallelujah. Proverbs 29. We're already filming, so we'll just hit the ground running. I don't think we caught it on the tape, but during praise and worship, the Lord said he's doing a new thing. His power is being poured out, visions being given at higher levels. And he told me our church services can never be the same. And we've heard that before. Every time you go to a new step, there's always a new release. Amen. And I don't want normal church services because the Spirit of God is supposed to be in charge of them. He's not normal. Amen? In fact, the world's trying to declare a new normal over the, over the nation, over the world. And uh, that it's going to be, you know, less fellowship, less so social activity. You know, that this is a new normal. And I believe the new normal is the Spirit of God taking over the land. Disrupting darkness. Releasing light. Huh? Where have you been? You playing games on the iPad again? Is that what it is? We watched a movie last night, and she says, I don't know what's going on. I says, because you cannot play games and watch a movie at the same time. Just teasing. Proverbs 29. Verse 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there's no vision, people perish. Now, it's not talking about natural eyesight. It's talking about spiritual eyesight. It's talking about vision that God gives, what God shows you. And where there's no vision, you're limited in natural eyesight. So if you're limited in natural eyesight, you're limited to man's plans and purposes and provision. If there's, no, if there's no spiritual eyesight, you have no comprehension of God's will for your life. And I really believe much of the church, if not the vast majority of the church, is in that place. That they're just trying to survive life. They're trying to, you know, take care of their family, be a nice person, hold down a job with no comprehension of the spiritual season that we're in. Now, God says you will know the season when you walk in light. That those that are in light will not be caught unawares. But much of the church has no comprehension that the glory is about to manifest. That it really is, the rapture is just around the corner. They have no comprehension of God's plan to, to transform the land and bring forth major revival and bring in his harvest. Amen. But those that are in the light know that God's up to something. And they see in the word, he's got end time plans and purposes. You know, in uh, Habakkuk chapter 2, which is really the chapter for this church, God told Habakkuk to write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it, right? Habakkuk 2.2. 2. So he said, the vision gives you a target to run towards. Where there's no vision, there's no known target. I mean, if I drew three or four of you up here to the front, I said, we're going to have a race. And I said, now go. Well, you wouldn't know which direction to go and where the finish line was. You could all be, you know, running off different directions. And in truth, the finish line was to touch the ceiling. Get a chair, climb on it, touch the ceiling. That was the race. But everybody was trying to go laterally when the vision was to take you vertically. Did you follow that analogy there? And God wants to take us vertically in our vision. To take us out of just running around in the rat race of, you know, humanity. And go to a place no man has gone before. I, uh, I remember when I was young, 
lot of the younger people won't even remember this or know about this, but TV used to go off the air at night. Like a, sometimes 11 o'clock, sometimes midnight, sometimes 1, depending on the channel, depending what day of the week. And, of course, they would play the Star Spangled Banner. And, and, uh, but they, they would, a lot of times they'd have this picture. I believe it was an F-4 Phantom jet. In fact, they switched it over, over the years. Flying up in the sky, and they would, they would play this, they would uh, say this poem. For I've slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced on laughter silver wings. And gone where neither eagle nor lark had flown. Something like that. And I'd go, yes. I've escaped the bonds of the earth. Even young, you know. And I'm up there soaring in this plane. And I really believe that's what God wants for the church. I believe it was almost prophetic for the church. That we're to slip away from just living normal lives. But you can't do it without spiritual vision. And, of course, when God told Habakkuk to write down that vision, that everyone that reads it should run towards it. I mean, it wasn't an accident. It's in your Bible. What was that vision? For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. See, everybody that's seeing with eyes of the Spirit right now, I'm going to say this again, 100% of every Christian seeing with truly anointed eyes of the Spirit right now, are seeing the glories about to come. Those that have been deceived or blinded or, or, or what would be the word distracted don't see that. They're caught up in other programs. If I was to ask the average pastor in America, and this is not to condemn anybody, it's just to, to point out where I believe God's taking us. If I was to ask them, what is your vision for the church? Some would say, well, you know, we want to have a nice set of nice benevolent programs to be a blessing to the community. We want to be a place where people can come and hear about the Lord and get born again. And others might say, well, you know, uh, we want to have some influence on leaders of the government or something like that. Which is, And those are all great. I mean, they're all good. But that's not the vision. That was not the vision God said in the Bible to run towards. But there's a small group of pastors throughout the world right now that have heard the Spirit of God and seen what He's showing. And they're not targeting just trying to be a benevolent body. Nothing wrong with that, you follow me, as far as doing that. Not just trying to influence the people in the the community. Not just trying to, again, how many know where to lead people to Jesus? but not just having some nice evangelistic programs. We're to be targeting raising up the body of Christ in the knowledge of the kingdom of heaven to manifest the end-time glory of God, which will produce bringing in the harvest, which will produce benevolence to the community, which will produce changing the hearts of the government systems. Amen. And God has a new normal he wants to bring forth of manifesting this end-time glory. You know, the prophecies we had come forth this morning about how God's doing a new thing and he's pouring out more power. What's that about? About manifesting the glory. Seeing a new thing about seeing how we can step into the glory. And there's been a, there's been a placebo fed to the church for really much of the past hundred years, really way beyond that. A placebo fed to the church that all we have to do is try to hold on to our faith in Jesus, live a decent life, and die. And that was God's plan. And that was never God's plan. Now, for past generations, that may have sufficed to be acceptable. Maybe that's all they could see. That was all they had the ability to have revelation for. You know, you got a circuit-riding preacher that visits you once every six weeks. You don't have television and CDs, maybe not even a printed Bible in many cases. It's going to limit what you can see spiritually. But not today. Not today. Today we are without excuse not to see what God is doing. Amen? And we've been talking here about competing visions, both natural vision and spiritual vision. And God's calling his church, your 2020 vision, right? to step into higher levels of seeing what God is looking at or what God prophetically is declaring. 
you know, if you're believing God for healing, you've got to see yourself healed. If you're believing God to prosper, you've got to see yourself beyond being broke. You don't even talk about yourself being broke. You don't say, well, I'm just, you know, I, I'm so poor I can't pay attention. You, you can't say that. You talk about how God's prosper you, prospered you in all things, just like you talk about how God's healed me of all sickness and disease. And you've got to see it to properly move into it. Well, God's got a whole much bigger vision than just incorporating healing and prosperity. Now, those are primary ones, right? John said in what, 3 John 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Those are important. But God's after the glory coming to the church. But if you don't see it, you cannot move into it. Now, we were talking here about how people have different types of natural vision. And I'm not going to take time to write them on the board this morning, but we talked about some people have business or finance vision. They're just, they're just, they can see investment opportunities. They can see how to cut corners or save money or just to multiply finances. Other people have computational vision. They're really good at science and math. Others are good artistically. They just have the ability to draw and, and, and write music and play the instruments. and what, They just see in a whole different realm. Amen. In fact, a whole lot of them are tapped into the demonic with what they see. Amen. There's a lot of artistry that is actually anointed by the devil. There's that anointed by God as well. But some people have tapped into a demonic realm with their art. And then there's mechanical vision. Now, mechanical is uh, really the one I think I most align with, is the ability to see mechanisms and understand how they work. Be able to take them apart and put them back together. And uh, it's different from science or computational vision because I've worked with engineers all of my life, and I've known a lot of engineers who could solve, you know, uh, drawing a whole blank here, solve complex mathematical equations, but can't change oil in their car. So they're slightly different. Then we talked about some people have vision for empathy. I mean, they just can see people that are hurting. Just a natural gift. We talked about that the gift of compassion is one of the motivational gifts. They're there to just to take care of people's hurts or feelings or help them out. Some people have the ability to extract, extrapolate data. They can foresee things that are coming along and potentially invest appropriately or prepare appropriately. And then we talked about last, last week, about out of Romans chapter 12, the seven motivational gifts. That's where I had that book I held up earlier. Uh, we're all, each given by God, we're birthed with natural personality giftings. And they really determine how you respond to different situations. Amen? And so uh, it's important to know those. And important to know that's something that everybody has. I want to start this morning with a couple other types of natural vision. And one of them is about to really come into its, I believe, its preeminence, maybe as no other time in history. Go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians 2. And I want to talk just for a second about hindsight. What, what is the saying about hindsight? Hindsight is 2020. And I believe this year we're going to see more people with hindsight than ever before. Here's what we should have done to stop the virus. And, and, and of course, it's all being a, a, everybody's accusing the president of it, right? Uh, here's what we should have done to stop the rioting. Here's what. There's going to be a whole bunch of people guessing with their hindsight. But somebody need to have some foresight in this thing, right? Somebody need to be able to see ahead of the game. But people tend to have hindsight. And the devil tries to attack people. 
regarding hindsight. In sports, they called them Monday morning quarterbacks. If only our team had done this, we could have won the game, right? But in, in a 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I love this passage. Starting with verse number... I know I am. Hang on a second. Verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Now Paul here is saying, I, we're speaking to you, we're teaching you revelation that the world does not know. It's hidden revelation. Now what's it mean when something's hidden? You can't see it. So God is saying, or Paul is saying, I'm revealing to you, I'm making known to you things you can see of the spirit that the natural eye cannot comprehend. Right? And my goodness, think of all the great revelation that Paul gave to us. There were new creations in Christ Jesus. Amen. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. And we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. What great vision was released to us in that. That we can now see ourselves as clean before God instead of a sinner. It was several years into my Christianity. In fact, Probably 11 years, I think it was, of my Christianity. I walked around calling myself a sinner. Well, you know, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. All my righteousness is just filthy rags. I'm just a worm compared to God. Until somebody taught, taught, and I heard it, that we are not filthy rags anymore. That God took away our uncleanness. He took away our sin and made us new creations. And get this. And when I saw that, when inside I saw that, it changed my whole appreciation for Christianity. Instead of walking around feeling like I was always failing God and always letting Him down, I realized He made up the difference. If I'll pursue Him with all my heart, Amen. He sees me sin free. If I will, if I will uh, endeavor to be led of the Spirit, I can walk with my head hit head held high. Without shame. Without fear of I'm going to be thrown into hell any minute. Because I let God down again. Did you ever have that feeling? Maybe you let God down one too many times. How many times will you forgive me for this one? So when I heard that revelation, light entered my soul. I was already saved 11 years, but light entered my soul and changed my whole appreciation for Christianity. And how I responded. To the Holy Spirit. Amen. So Paul says I'm giving you this hidden wisdom. But look at verse 8. Which none of the princes of this world. Now hold on for just a second. The princes of the world is talking about the demonic powers. The prince of the power there. He's talking about Satan and his cohort, cohorts. Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it. They would not have crucified the Lord of glory. See this excites me. So many people are walking around afraid of what the devil's going to do. The devil can't say two, see two inches in front of him. He only has natural vision. Even though he's a demonic power, he only has vision limited to the lower heavens. He cannot see prophetically. But you can see prophetically. You can see what's coming down the road. See, the devil knows that it's prophesied in the word that God's bringing the glory. But somehow God's given him a bonehead that he thinks he really can stop it. He thinks he really can stop the plans of God from manifesting. He really thinks he may have a chance of winning in the end. And so he keeps doing these stupid, stupid things. And of course, what's the defi definition of insanity? You do the same thing over and over again thinking you'll get different results. He's insane. Look at what he's doing now. His MO has always been to overstretch and overreach and expose himself. Much as he wants to hide, he always overexposes himself. And it's going to work against him again. Amen. Instead of getting the, the nation to bow down to fear and hate, it's going to, it's going to be overturned and love's going to manifest like never before. Amen. 
and peace. And so, you have better eyesight than the devil. Now, you may not be able to see him and he can see you, but you can see what's ahead of you and he can't. Because the devil only has hindsight. And right now, for the last 2,000 years, he's been walking in great regret that he attacked Jesus. Had he left him alone, he'd have just stayed one on earth. But now there's millions of us, and there's going to be billions of us before this is done. Walking in the same power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus walked in. Can you see that? Let's read on verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen, talking about natural eye, nor ear, natural ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man, the natural man, the things which God has prepared for them that love him. In other words, those that don't love God can't see what others are going to see. Because he says in verse 10, but God had revealed them unto us by his spirit. Now follow me. He says, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor heart received what God's prepared for us. Naturally speaking. But you have received them. You have access to an eyesight and a hearing and a receiving ability in your heart of the things the world has no access to, including the devil. Patty and I, because of the memorial last week, uh, the Martins came over and spent a couple days with us from Illinois and uh, brought their granddaughter. And if we weren't in church, we were pretty much playing cards. And the card game we play is one that is just the, basically the only card game in the state of Kansas. It's called Pitch. Has anybody ever played Pitch? It's all they play. Now, there's about 400 variations. And I know them all. I was raised with pitch. I was raised with pitch. And, and so I've taught it to them, and we love the game. But in the game, you deal out cards to everybody. And in most cases, in the middle, there'll be like four to six cards called the Widow. And you bid whoever wants to, you know, try to make so many points. And whoever wins the bid, names their trump, and then they get the Widow. And it's like the surprise, extra cards. And it's amazing how many times you'll pull it up and there's nothing in there. There may be great cards, but it's not the trump you called. Had you known what was in the widow, you would have changed what you called trumps. Other times there's the cards exactly what you needed. It was like you foreknew and you even bid, bid too high, taking a risk, and your cards were in the widow. And so it's, like, it's almost like getting to go to the candy store as a kid. Like, I get to look at the widow. You're bidding just to get the chance to look at those cards, right? And, of course, you get what's in it. That's trumps. And so uh, the thing is, is if you could ever look into that widow, say you had x-ray vision to see what was in the widow, before you bid, you would never lose a game. You'd have all those extra cards. You would know it was in there ahead of time. And it would be like your superpower to never lose. Are you following what I'm talking about? In other words, you have the cards in your hand that you naturally see, but there's six surprise cards there. You don't know what's in it. And if you could see into those, you would never lose. To tell Bob and Debbie to listen to this message. Pastors Bob and Debbie. And think for a minute that you had that power. Would you use it? I mean, if you were allowed to, would you use that power to see what was in the widow? Well, yeah, you'd be stupid not to. And God gave us spiritual vision to see what's ahead of us. That if we'll see what's ahead of us, we will never lose. If we know what's coming, if we know what God's about to do, and even what the devil's about to do, if we're walking, how many of the Holy Spirit knows everything? And he wants to release it to us. If we will walk with this vision to see what's ahead of us, that the devil does not have power to activate, we would be foolish not to use it. We would be foolish not to tap into this gift to see what lies in front of us. 
that nobody else has access to. But how many Christians are tapping into that spiritual vision? How many are saying, God, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. You will speak to me. You will show me what's coming down the pipe. I release my faith right now to hear prophetically what's coming forth. Now, here's what's interesting to me. Is this okay with you? As I've mentioned several times, I've been now serving up for 36 years, and I've been in revival as far as pursuing revival, all of it, from the day I was saved. I have never, ever, and I'm sure there's never, ever been in the history of mankind a year that's been more, there's been more prophetic release of what's coming along. I mean, it was prophesied. It was prophesied that there was a virus being created in Wuhan, China that would shut down the nation for four months. Tracy Cook said it January 3rd that God showed it to him. Prophesied in detail. And I believe because I'd seen his accuracy before. Remember Tracy's accuracy with the video we watched at the time? He's telling people, you know, when their birthday is and everything, just extreme accuracy with word of knowledge. So when he said God showed him a virus in Wuhan, China, before we even knew anything about Wuhan, and it would affect the nation for four, for four months, so then when the natural prognosticators come on, when CNN starts saying it's going to shut down the nation for two years, maybe ten years, you know, we've got to wear masks from now on, and you can never go in public again. I mean, this is basically what they were fear-mongering. I'm going, nope, it ends in four months. Actually, by then, by the time I saw the video, it had already been two months. Nope, it ends right about Passover. It diminishes then. By Pentecost, it's basically over. And you know what? I don't even think about masks anymore. There was a while, you know, we come in from the outside, been out in public. Where's the hand sanitizer? Got to wash my hands. Three minutes. Scrub. I didn't, but I mean, that's kind of the mindset. Oh, what did I touch? Now we're finding out that asymptomatic people don't hardly pass it all on at all, and you can't hardly get it from contact services. Somebody's got to basically sneeze in your face or cough. And it was all a facade. Regardless of the facade, I knew about Passover, this thing diminishes. About Pentecost, we don't even think about masks anymore. Some do, they're holding on to their fear. You follow me? But I don't even think, I don't, you know, for a while, oh, don't touch your mouth, don't touch your eyes, don't touch your face, you know. Now, I've forgotten all about all those rules. I don't know about you, I don't think about it. My itches, I'll scratch it. The point is, God's pouring a prophetic vision this year, the year of 2020 vision, like I have never, ever seen it. Why would he be doing that? Why would it be like that? Because it's time to give the giftings of the body to never lose. Remember the card game? If you could see the widow, you would never lose. And he's given us prophetic vision. We cannot be defeated. We cannot lose because the devil does not have that ability. Now, the devil could see in the card game what's in there. There's a good chance he may know what those cards are. But he can't see what's in the future. And we can so I'm expecting the prophetic increase in this church and in the nation, in the church worldwide at a level we've never before seen. I believe that's why you had to have that word. That gift has got to be, it's got to be guarded and protected and fueled and fed because it's a gift of the body of Christ. As all the prophetic operations are, as all giftings are, but this is a year of vision. Amen? And all the devil has is hindsight. And you know what? You know what happens when people get hindsight? They tend to become critical. Hindsight's almost, almost always used to criticize, isn't it? And watch this year. It's going to be a year. You're going to hear hindsight expressed like possibly never before. 
Now, I wasn't alive during World War II. And I'm sure there was a lot of hindsight regarding battles and the natural taking place then. Of course, a lot of stuff wasn't known. We didn't have the information flow like we do today. But this year, with all the news networks, all the cameras everywhere, it's going to be your major, major hindsight. Now, you still with? How long have I been going, Charles? I planned that. Go to Proverbs chapter 28. I'm still talking about natural vision, but we're, we're intermeshing some spiritual teaching, right? Proverbs 28. And let's go to verse number 22. He that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye. A twisted eyesight. He that's in a hurry to be rich or he's focused singularly on money, it affects his vision. Amen? And considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. And then God says, you're in a hurry to get rich, you're ready to get poor. Now, we know out of Scripture, in fact, let's go there and look at that. First Timothy. Chapter 6. Are you there? Let's go to verse number 10. No, let's start at verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. I think I mentioned this Thursday night. I had a revelation the other day. It just kind of dawned on me. I was reading about uh, how God's going to burn up the entire world with unquenchable heat. You know what I'm talking about, right? At the end, he's going to recreate everything. And everything we've ever invested in, everything we've ever built, everything we've ever done naturally is going to be gone. And I said, but God, not my robot. Don't take my robot, amen. I had to let it go. Still in my house, but I have to let it go. Someday my robot's going to be burnt up with unquenchable fire. Oh, well, it just ministered to me. Verse 8, and having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. With food and clothing... We should be happy. And everything above that becomes a bonus. Versus trying to keep up with everybody else and have what everybody else has. Be happy with what God's blessed you with. Right? Paul said, I've learned in whatever state I'm in, therewith to be content. Now, in Kentucky, that's pretty easy. But think if you lived in California or Illinois, whatever state you're in. He said, I'll learn whatever state I'm in therewith to be content. It'd be hard to be content if you lived in the state of Illinois. Now you get it, right? Verse 9. But they that will be rich, singularly focused on, targeting as their top priority, fall into temptation and a snare and unto many foolish and hurtful lusts, which draw men into destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money. Money's neutral. Money merely reflects the heart of the one that possesses it. God wants the righteous to have money, but not money to have the righteous, right? While some having coveted after have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now, I've mentioned this many times. A lot of people want money so they don't have to use their faith. If I have money, I can hire the best doctors, right? If I, if, I, if I had money, you know, I can buy the best vehicles. If I have money, I can have the best car, whatever, or I mean best house. That money becomes the answer to their concerns versus God. But there's another, another aspect of this. When you set yourself 
targeting. You want money above all things. You then become willing to compromise your integrity to get it. Do you follow me on that? I mean, you're going to the store and they don't charge you for a pair of pants. You know, you get outside and you realize they didn't charge you. What do you do? Oh, God just blessed me with $20. You're willing to compromise your integrity for $20. Right? Or, you know, you're trying to deal with somebody and you know something's worth a lot more, but you're willing to con them out of whatever because, you you know, you want you may be willing to compromise your integrity. Money is it causes a temptation to arise to be deceitful. And whenever you start entertaining deception, you open yourself up to deceiving spirits. And when deceiving spirits come in at a high enough level, you can't even tell what is truth anymore. And you will have, how can I say, flawed vision. We've been called not to compromise that. Now, I'm sure I've probably told this story in here before, and it's a little bit, it's a little bit off color. So you all will bear with me, right? But there was, this, there was this beautiful woman who was at a party. She'd been invited to this party. really didn't know anybody, but she'd been invited. Went to this party. She's really attractive. It wasn't my wife. It was another, another one. And this very wealthy man comes up to her. He know, she knows. She's heard of him. He's like a billionaire. And he walks up and he says to her, he says, you are stunningly beautiful. I want to make a proposition. Would you spend the night with me for a million dollars? You know what I mean by spend the night, right? And she's going, man, a million dollars, that's a lot of money. And uh, she thinks about it and goes, you know, I could pay off my debts. I could get a car, get a house. And she says, you know, one night, yeah, I would do it for a million dollars. He says, well, would you spend the night with me for $50? Have you heard this before? And she goes, $50? What kind of girl do you think I am? He said, we've already established that. Now we're just negotiating price. See, money will make you compromise. If it's enough and your heart's connected to it, compromise your integrity. Compromise your ethics. And so we got to make sure that our vision is not on funds, but it's on the word. It's on what God can do. And to be content and not be drawn into the lures of the world that, that you have to target money. Listen, I expect to be very wealthy. I had a, I had a prophet from Hawaii come through probably 15 years ago to one of our conferences, never met him before. His name was Wayne Anderson. Well, I'm sure it still is his name. And uh, his name's Wayne Anderson. He was calling people up and prophesying very accurately. And he came by my chair, and he stopped, and he says, God says your prosperity is tied to your writing. He says, has God called you to write books? I said, no. He said, yeah, he has. No, I wouldn't accept no. Because I hated to write. But down here I knew it was true. But I'm, mm -mm. I apologized to him later. He, he wasn't too happy with my apology. He said, you know, I guess I'm supposed to write a book on love. Well, now I'm writing the books. You follow me? And last month I sold 20 books on Amazon. It's like a new record. Made $54. I'm in the money now. <laughs> And I ordered 100 books yesterday of the new Eight Steps book. So they'll be in here very shortly. Anyway, he said your prosperity is tied to your writing. Well, listen, I don't like to write, but I do like to be in the will of God. You follow me? So I make myself make myself write. And I expect to become very wealthy. Not just from that, but from God's blessing because I've sown so much. I've sown, you know, considering what I've given up, millions of dollars to the gospel. Considering what I've given up in salary and everything else. Well, not millions, over a million. And uh, 
I expect God's blessing, but I'm not targeting it. You follow me? I'm not targeting just being wealthy. I'm targeting the glory. And God's looking for people that will get their eyes off of money and put it on the prophetic vision of God. Did you follow all of that? And so, this is an exciting time to be alive. Now, I want to shift gears. And uh, let me write this on the board. We put this up here a few weeks ago. In fact, the circle shadow's still there. And we draw a picture, see if I can follow it. We call it uh, the first heaven, which is the natural universe, including the earth. It's the first heaven realm. It's the realm of science, the realm of man's ability. In fact, it's the realm of the natural laws of physics. It's the realm of matter. Now, again, I love this statement. As an engineer, they trained us in the laws of physics. And they told us because of the law of entropy, the second law of thermodynamics, there had to be a beginning of the universe. It's, it's a stated law in every, how can I say, thermodynamics textbook. There had to be a beginning because the universe is slowly winding down. If it went back for infinity, it would already be burned out. So we know there was a beginning and we know there will be an end unless something interrupts it. Because everything's slowly winding down, burning out through time. Everything's coming to a state of equal heat. And uh, so they knew there was a beginning, and they told us at the beginning, three things had to come into existence simultaneously. Space, time, and matter. There had to be a beginning time, and there had to be matter because that makes up the universe and a space to put it. And they're really all tied together. And the first verse of the Bible says, in the beginning, time, God created the heavens, space, and matter, the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All three things that, that physicists will tell you had to come into place simultaneously were all in the first verse of the Bible. That's all you need to know that God is real. I mean, that, that should do it in itself, that God will put that as the first verse of Genesis. Right? So when he created all this, the first heaven was birthed and everything in it, including Pluto and Jupiter and the sun and everything beyond, because it all follows the same laws of physics. Then we talked about looks like an egg. We talked about a third heaven where the throne of God is, right? Where the angels go on vacation to get away from us. It's, it's the realm of the laws of the spirit. It's the, it's the realm of spiritual vision. It's the realm where when people die, they go to be with Jesus, right? I mentioned that book, Imagine Heaven, that talks about all the glories of the third heaven. And this third heaven follows a whole different set of laws than this realm, right? You function in this realm, you can walk through walls, you can walk on water, you can translate, you can, you can actually supersede the laws of physics. So that's the third heaven. Then we talked about a second heaven. This was the spirit. This was the natural. We talked about a second heaven, which is the realm of the soul, which is an actual dimension where thought and emotion have tangibility. Where, you know, and you, this is true. We know it's true, but we just didn't know how to define it in the past. That if you get around people that are fighting, you may feel angry yourself. What's going on right now in some of the cities? There's a rage that is contagious. See, when demonic spirits enter an the area, they bring their personality. And it affects the atmosphere that we're in in that second heaven realm. It's an actual heavenly buffer between the third and the second. You can't even get to the third unless you pass through the second. Revelation that comes to you comes from heaven, but it's got to go through your mind before you can manifest it on earth. Through your soul, right? 
And so this second heaven is the realm of the demonic. Different color here. This is the demonic realm. It's the realm of witchcraft. It's the realm of thought. It's the realm dominated by emotion. And again, the devil can read your thoughts. I believe in the second heaven, thoughts have voice. That's why he has conversations with you. Have you ever heard the devil answer you? I've heard people say the devil can't read your thoughts. He just guesses what you're going to say. He guesses really accurately then because he'll argue with me for some time. And respond me word for word. Amen. See, in that second heaven, thoughts have voice. And emotions are tangible. So that's why you can have mob riots. That's why in a football game, momentum is so important because it affects the second heaven. It affects everybody involved, including the players. There's an energy that, um, that emotional charging releases. And the devil is a master at trying to bombard people with negative thoughts. You follow me? And surround them with demonic, emotional, how can I say, affecting presence. There are spirits of murder that will make people feel like they have to murder. Uh, again, I was involved for several years in a group trying to study not study, but to, uh, that's the wrong word, to uh, eliminate pornography from the area, hardcore pornography. And so we watch videos about the effects of pornography and what it does, it desensitizes. And when people get involved in hardcore porn, they may think it's just exciting at first, but it's so desensitized, they have to go to harder and harder porn, more and more severe things. The next thing you know, well, over time, they end up, you know, watching snuff films. We saw in Kentucky, they just arrested two people for bestiality here this last week. It, it has an impact, and what happens is their soul gets so dominated by these demonic entities hammering on them, they can't get relief unless they act out what the thoughts are telling them to do because they've given themselves over to those open doors. Did you, did you follow that? And so what happens, the enemy... To, to prevent stuff going from this realm to this realm, tries to dominate this realm because it's the buffer. Do you remember when Daniel set himself to hear God? He fasted for three weeks with no pleasant bread. And then finally, uh, Gabriel, I believe, I believe it was, showed up. And he said, he said, from the day you started seeking God, I set out to come to you. But the prince of Persia resisted me until Michael the archangel came along and helped me, the warring angel, break through. And for your efforts, I've brought you this revelation. And of course, the book of Daniel, my goodness, what a book of prophetic vision. It was coming even in our days. You can't properly study the book of Revelation without the book of Daniel. They, they, they complement each other. And so we have Michael and Gabriel fighting with the prince of Persia, which is a demonic entity. Where was that battle taking place? Well, it wasn't in the third heaven. It wasn't in the first. It was in the second heaven. See, God had a revelation to bring to Daniel from the third to the second, or the first, but there was a war in trying to cross this buffer to bring the revelation, the devil was trying to stop it. But as Daniel kept seeking God, I believe it empowered God to release more support to fight through and bring him that answer. So you don't realize how much demonic resistance is trying to hold you, hold back your answers. But they don't have foresight, they only have hindsight. You have the ability to see your victory ahead of time. So this is a realm of demonic Warfare. This is his main battleground. You heard the mind is your battlefield, right? The battlefield of the mind. Joyce Meyer used to teach on that. And it's true. It's the realm of thought and emotion. That's the second heaven realm. Now, what's interesting is we showed before, is if this is us over here, 
Hands raised, right? God gave you senses to all three realms. Now, we covered this a few weeks ago, so we're just reviewing. You have a sense of touch, which gives you five senses that access the first heaven. You have a heart that's seated in the heavenly place with Christ. You have access to the third heaven. And you have a soul that can sense thought and emotion, which gives you access to the second heaven. In fact, Ephesians 2.6 says, We are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. It didn't say seated in the heavenly place. It said places, plural. God gave you access to three different heavens. And it says Jesus is with you in all three. He's with you no matter where you're at. But God built man. This is what's amazing to me. God built man with detectors into all three heavens. So as a Christian, you're not supposed to live based on what you think or what you feel. You're to live based on the word. And the leading of the spirit down here where the enemy has no access. And what God gave us our emotions for is not to live based on how we feel. Well, if it feels good, do it. You're going to end up in major trouble if that's your motto. Amen? No, he gave you the... Have you seen the movies where maybe there was a nuclear accident or something and they had the Geiger counters to tell them where the level was? When I was uh, younger, my girls were younger, I built a cootie detector. And I'd use it around my girls all the time. And I'd go around the house, Oh, I'm making so mad. I go, I found cooties. And I could go higher than I go. <laughs> the girls didn't like it, but Patty thought it was hilarious. She still gets tickled. And God gave you emotions as a demonic cootie detector. And you've got to train yourself to use your emotions properly. How many know the Bible says to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ? You know, Philippians 4, 8, what th so are things are true, honest, just, pure, love, of good report, being a virtue, being praised, think on these things. He tells you what to think on. And if it's not in line with that, you should cast it down. And much of the church is learning, you just can't live by whatever pops in your head. You've got to cast down Thoughts that don't agree with the word, right? How many took work? That took effort to learn that. How many know we're still learning that? But we have a responsibility to filter and monitor what we think to determine is it from God, is it from the devil, or is it from me? Or is it my wife's voice? You have to filter these out. And you only obey what's from God or from your wife. <laughs> I say husbands, then I have every woman here bristling. No, -uh -uh. it's okay for the man to have to obey the wife, but not the wife, the husband. That's backwards. I'm gonna leave that one on right now. We've learned, we have learned, at least we're learning to filter what we hear, what we think, and if it's not in line with the word, we don't think on it. And those that learn it spend too much of their time walking around going, I cast that down. Mm -mm. I cast that down. Nope, not my, not my thought. Nope, nope. Shut up, devil. I bind it in Jesus. Shut up, devil, in Jesus' name. Glory to God. would not scare anybody. And I'll walk around the house sometimes doing it. Patty, what you doing? It's not important. I cast that down too. Yes, you ought to mind it. No, I cast that down too. Amen. And you control your thoughts. But the next step is also controlling or properly using your emotions as cootie detectors. And when you walk in a place, you're always alert. What are you feeling? You know, we had some things happen last week over the past few weeks that some great, some not great as far as how we should feel. And God had me just studying how I felt. And I talked about how do you feel? I feel kind of numb. 
Is that how you should feel? No, I should feel fire. But I feel kind of numb, God. You, you follow me? I have to converse with God, with the Spirit of God, how I felt. Well, we can use our emotions to walk in a room and decide who's occupying this space. Do I feel peace and love or do I feel strife? Am I anxious? Do I feel oppression? Do I feel fear? Feel rage? What do you, and you, you feel it and you go, wait a minute. This is not peace or joy or love. This is something I don't like the feel of. Instead of saying, well, I feel angry. Who can I chew out? You go, this is a demon trying to take this space. Because wherever the demons go, they take their, they take their demonic energy and try to dominate the atmosphere of the second heaven, both thoughts and emotions. And when you realize it's not God, you have choices. Two proper choices. Three choices. One, you can stay there and react to it. But the two proper choices either leave or make an effort to change it. See, there's a place I go. If I don't like what I'm feeling, I'll just leave. Even watching the news sometimes, I'll feel, I don't like this feeling. I don't, I, I, it's making me feel angry. This isn't God. Now, there's a righteous anger, but this isn't, wasn't right. This just make me feel angry. Time to get out of the room. Turn the TV off or whatever. And, uh, it, it, or maybe sorrow. Don't submit yourself to it. But how do we change it? Well, again, we mentioned this a few weeks ago. If we draw near to God, he draws near to us. Right? So you start worshiping and praising God. So what happens is, as we mentioned before, the devil has spent much effort to bring in gross darkness to cloud up this area. That's what gross darkness does. It, it obscures light. He's trying to fill the earth, fill regions with this darkness that people can't see truth. So what we do is we're here, we start praising God. We start praising God using our efforts to draw clear to God, close to God in this region. And it says we draw near to him, he draws near to us, right? God inhabits the praises of his people. So as we draw near to him, we're, we're implementing the principle of the first step, right? For those that have been here very long. And it, God responds by drawing near to us out of the third heaven. The meeting place becomes the second heaven. And when God's presence comes in, it eradicates darkness. And now all of a sudden, instead of darkness obscuring light, because we took time to draw near to him, now light can flood this region. And that's the effects of the glory. It wipes out, it displaces demonic powers. And all of a sudden, now people can hear the gospel. They can see the truth. They recognize the, the error of their past efforts, whatever. And this is why the harvest will come in when the glory comes. Amen. And so, the earth being filled with glory tells us that our sons and daughters will come from far. Wealth will come in because people have this giving motivation now. It's going to fix everything. And that's God's plan. Is to dominate this darkness with released light. I know the verse I was going to say and I forgot what it was now. Anyway, that's why it says in Isaiah 60, darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness of people, but his light shall arise and be seen on thee. And we're in a place where darkness is not being confronted by light. And the more we press and refuse to respond to these atmospheres, but instead we oppose them, we can bring us light. So here's the danger right now. Here's the danger for the world, the church, and even us. Because all the stuff is bombarding our eyesight right now. Our ears and our eyes. These these activities they want to create intense anger intense with sword i want 
indignance. Is that the right word, indignance? Indignation. Didn't think it sounded right. Intense indignation. This is not right. Well, a lot of stuff isn't right. But what are you going to do? Are you going to let the darkness that's up here permeate you here? As far as your mind, how you feel, how you respond, what you want to take place? Are you going to combat it with praise and speak the word and speak the prophetic verses of Scripture? Yes, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as well as covered the sea. And refuse to be moved by all this really demonic smoke screen. So God gave us these emotions. I'm out of time. God gave us these emotions not to act in alignment with whatever we feel, but to use them to recognize as, as, as demonic cootie detectors. And to decide what we need to displace. What do we need to shift around us? And that's the assignment for the church. But you've got to see it. See, if you can't see the glory coming, if you can't see what God's really got wants us focused on, then you have no choice but to just see what you see naturally and respond to. You got to see, you have to see above. You have to see vertically. Versus laterally. And I'm telling you, what an exciting time to be on God's side. Did you get anything out of this this morning? I didn't get to where I was going with this example. But another area of, of eyesight we've got to resist. I'll talk about it next week. Because we've got to resist getting involved in any type of divination activities. Because there's eyesight there's, there's natural eyesight, there's spiritual eyesight, but there's also eyesight the devil grants. He's got his own form of revelation. And those involved in psychic activity, those involved in witchcraft, divination, even horoscopes, all connect you to a false vision that is really demonically rooted. And you have to resist they're even conjuring. I, I, I got to stop or I'm going to preach next week's message. <laughs> Father, we thank you for your word. Seal it in our hearts, our minds, our understanding. Cause each of us to rise above just living normal lives and to determine I will apply myself to the systems and principles of the kingdom of heaven. I will control what I think. I will properly use my emotions. And I will give the devil no ground or foothold in my life or my household to enable him to set up camp. Father, we thank you, Lord, because revelation comes. Sometimes we realize errors we've made. And I thank you, you're so much greater than our, mistake, our mistakes. So, Father, we repent from any past efforts to give the devil ground. Any place we've allowed our emotions to run out of control. The Spirit of God come in and take over and show us how to control our thoughts and to dominate the atmospheres wherever we go. We thank you, Father, for the gifts you've given us to let us see the future. See beyond what the devil can see. We ask you to amplify those gifts. Give us enhanced vision. In Jesus' name. In this church, there are none sick, none in lack, none oppressed, none in fear, none in strife. We thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Amen.